Well, good morning. Again, it's good to be able to share the word with you this morning. If you have your Bibles, uh, go ahead and open up to Mark chapter 4. Mark chapter 4, that's page 788 if you're using the Sanctuary Bible, 788. Before we get going into our sermon, I'd like to uh, welcome Cliff and Brenda uh, German as new members. They're right here. They've been attending with us for some time. If you want to stand up just so everybody can see who you are. (laughs) Praise the Lord. Thank you. Thank you. And it's just a neat thing to see people making a commitment to uh, to the body here and just saying, hey, this is my place where God has led us to, to fellowship and to be committed to. And uh, so if you if you have any questions about membership and you'd like to um, to get those answered, go ahead and go back to the uh, information center and there will be some packets there. There will also be some contacts and you can talk to uh, Gary and Barbara um, Weiss, who are not here at this time. Uh, and we do have a bunch of people, like Diana was mentioning, at, uh, at the church camp at Willow Lake. And so they're enjoying the, uh, the beauty of the area, enjoying the fellowship of the Lord, uh, having devotions together, and just a good time. And hopefully next year we'll, we'll have more people out there doing this. This is just a lot of fun. So we're going to come back and hear some, they're going to come back and, and share their reports of how that went. Okay, so we are in Mark chapter 4, verse 21, and we're going to read through verse 34. If you, I would invite you to stand with me as we honor God's word, and I turn actually over to the book of Mark as I've been talking this whole time. I'm in Matthew, so it's going to sound a little different if I read out of that book. <clears throat> Mark chapter 4, verse 21 and following. And he said to them, is a lamp brought in to be put under a basket or a be- under a bed and not on a stand? For nothing is hidden except to be made manifest, nor is anything secret except to come to light. If anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. And he said to them, pay attention to what you hear. With the measure you use, It will be measured to you, and still more will be added to you. For to the one who has, more will be given. And from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. And he said, the kingdom of God is as if a man should scatter seed on the ground. He sleeps and rises night and day, and the seed sprouts and grows. He knows not how. The earth produces by itself, first the blade, then the ear, then the full grain in the ear. But when the grain is ripe, at once he puts in the sickle, and because the harvest has come. And he said, with what can we compare the kingdom of God, or what parable shall we use for it? It is like a grain of mustard seed, which, when sown on the ground, is the smallest of all the seeds of the earth, yet when it is grown or sown, it grows up and becomes larger than all the garden plants and puts out large branches so that the birds of the air can make nests in its shade. With many such parables, he spoke the word to them as they were able to hear it. He did not speak to them without a parable, but privately to his own disciples, he explained everything. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this word that you've given through your son, Jesus. We thank you, Lord, that truth is here. Although we may not understand exactly what it's saying, Lord, give us your enlightenment, give us your understanding, illumination of this passage because we want to honor you. We want to be the ones who hear your word and obey it. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. In the book of Daniel, he is given a prophecy. 
This man of God who was living in Babylon, who was living under the, um, under the control of another government, another people, he's given this prophecy in Daniel chapter 12, and it's this. But you, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book, that which was given to him at that time, that prophecy. Shut it up until the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall increase. Interesting prophecy that's given there. Many are going to run to and fro in the end times. And I tell you what, think of this. Yesterday, or I should say Friday, I went down to Oakland, hundreds of miles away, drove back yesterday. In that same amount of time, I could have gotten on an airplane and flown to Europe and come back. That's going to and fro. I mean, that's literal prophecy. Uh, now we're going on beyond into space and things like that, talking about going back to the moon, to Mars. That's a serious going to and fro, right? But then it says, and knowledge shall increase. Knowledge shall increase. The availability of knowledge today is absolutely incredible. Right here, right here. I got my smartphone, and it is way smarter than I am. <clears throat> on our trip yesterday, coming back on the five, and you know there's nothing out there. Oh, we would just be asking questions. Okay, who sang this song? Who did this? Where did this person go? And in a moment, you have all the information. Oh, how far to the next rest stop? In a moment, you have all of that information. It's all available. I could probably look up how to build a pulpit just like this. And it would give me all the instructions. How to build a building. But how to build a kingdom? Do we have information? I bet you could find something. And it usually starts off with, you need an army. Uh, you, you, need, you need some resources, some money, some supplies. You need some smarts. All of that could probably be available with that smartphone. In this passage right here, what we're looking at, and it already started uh, back earlier in the, uh, in the passage with the, the last uh, parable, or the first parable that he shows, or uh, teaches, the parable of the soils, talking about the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God. Oh, we, taught, we maybe mentioned that, the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven, and we have this kind of ethereal sense of what it is, this big castle up on a cloud, and, and, and we're playing harps or something like that. You know, just something that just really doesn't make sense. The kingdom of God was huge in Jesus' teaching. And in the Gospels, as he's going through the land of Israel, he's talking about the kingdom of God. His preaching focused on the kingdom of God is at hand. It's right here. And he himself was the king, is the king, the Messiah, the one who had been promised for literally centuries in the Jewish uh, writings. He was presenting himself as the king of that kingdom. So, what is the kingdom like? What does the kingdom entail? What about the subjects of the kingdom? How are they going to act? Well, that's what this is all talking about. And so this helps the people who Jesus is talking to there in the Galilee region of, of Israel to understand, okay, the kingdom is here, and this is how I'm supposed to act. This is how it's going to unfold but it goes down to our day right here, 2,000 years later. What is the kingdom of God supposed to be like right here amongst us? <clears throat> the main point of this story, uh, story uh, of this text is the rule and reign of Jesus in his kingdom is an unstoppable force. It's an unstoppable force. It's going to happen. It has happened. It will continue to happen. So we, as the people in the kingdom, need to understand 
where we fit in, how this is supposed to work. What are we supposed to be occupied with right here and now in 2024 in the kingdom of God? Now, there's three parables here. The first one doesn't look like a parable, really. It looks more like Proverbs. It's not a story. Uh, but there's basically three uh, parables here. And the, and the word parable means uh, that which is cast alongside of. So it's a parallel story using some really kind of common terms that the people of the day really would have understood. It was an agrarian society. Uh, ancient Israel lived by planting, harvesting, reaping. They didn't go down to Safeway. They didn't go over to Costco. They didn't have that available, okay? So they had to grow their own. Oh, shoot. Well, a lot of people grow their own here in Southern Oregon, but that's something very different. <laughs> but we ha they had to grow their own food. We don't have to do that. Anybody here grow their own food for survival? Probably not. It's more for entertainment or just have good, healthy stuff at home. But we could buy it at the store. So <clears throat> these people understood these stories because they were the everyday life of the people of Israel. And, it's, uh, and the purpose, we learned last week, was to reveal and conceal. If you just go up a few verses, and you can uh, read, uh, oh, I lost it. Uh, anyways, a few verses up. And he, um, oh yeah, it's going to be in verse... I didn't mark it in here, did I? Well, you go up a few verses, and it's a quote from Isaiah. <laughs> See, guys, if anybody can, if, if I can do this, you can be used by God, okay? Um, but he quotes from Isaiah and saying that, that these people are going to be able to hear what I'm saying. They're going to hear the words I'm saying, and, but they're not going to be able to perceive what it means. And it's the heart's preparation that allows the message of God to be understood. It's all about the soil, and that's the, that's the, um, the illustration that's used in that parable of the soils. It's the, the good soil being able to receive the word of God and understand it, and it brings out uh, all kinds of uh, good things, of fruit. So that's the, and, and so some people are going to get it, some people are not going to get it. Hopefully we'll get it today. Now what I'd like to do is kind of skip down from verse 21, and let's go to verse 23. This has been said once before, and it will be repeated by Jesus several times through the Gospels, through the Synoptic Gospels. But listen to verse 23, read that there. If anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. And he said to them, pay attention to what you hear. Now, if you were to go back into the parable of the sowers, uh, or the soil, you would see in verse 15, in the middle of the verse, when they hear, he's ex Jesus is explaining what this means, but he says this, when they hear, Go down to verse 16 with the rocky ground. When they hear the word. Go down to verse 18. They are those who hear the word. Do you see? We're repeating a word. It's, it's purposefully repeated. Then in verse 20 with the good soil, they're the ones who hear the, the word. So there's two things that are engaged there. It's hearing and the word, the word of God. In the Gospels, it says uh, in, in uh, one of the other uh, accounts of, of the uh, parable of the soil, it says that the, the word, the, the seed is the word of God. So it's the word that he's speaking, the word that is implanted, the word that is written, and one could even say the word as in Jesus Christ. Hearing the word. And here, 
In verse 23, if anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. Just because you have these flappy pieces of cartilage covered with flesh doesn't mean you're hearing God. Hearing and listening, two different things. Talk to any teacher, and you're telling the kids all the instructions. They're looking at you. They understand every word that's coming out of your mouth, but they don't get it. It doesn't connect in here. And we do that as human beings. We hear, we understand every word. It's spoken in English or spoken in the language of our mother tongue, but we don't really let it penetrate. We don't understand. Yet last week we said like the heart is, is kind of like the, the mind. It's, you know, we, we refer to it as the mind. It's, it's how we process things, how we accept things and, and rationalize things and, and then move on that, uh, that information. <clears throat> It is absolutely important that we hear. And then in verse 24, uh, in the second part, it says, pay attention to what you hear. Pay attention, focus. In other words, Jesus is basically saying, look at me in the eyes and really lock into what I'm saying. Because far too often, we let it pass, we let it pass. Way back in the beginning when God had called Israel out of the land of Egypt, they had spent 40 years in the wilderness because they really didn't listen. Moses is giving them the law of God the second time in Deuteronomy. In chapter 6, verses 4 through 6, this is Shema. This is the, the, the uh, prayer that the Israelites, when they woke up every morning, would pray. And here's the words. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God. The Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. How does this start off? Hear. Listen up. Pay attention. We get that in the book of Mark. Pay attention. Love God with everything you have. Dedicate yourself to him. This is the most important thing Moses is saying to the people then. And these words that I command you, the words that Moses was going to give, the, the, the law of God that he received from God himself shall be on your heart. It's not to bounce off your heart. It's not like to the seed on the rocky soil. It's not the, the seed on the pathway that's hard and just, just stays on the surface and doesn't penetrate. Let the word of God penetrate your life and impact you and change the way you live. That's what it's saying. So because Jesus says this in Mark, <laughs> and you hear the word here all the time that this is going on, th this is an emphasis point. The importance of attentiveness. The people back then were challenged to pay attention. Oh, they had had the word of God for literally centuries, but they grew hard in their heart. We have had the word of God amongst us as a people for centuries, and yet we've grown tired of it, hardened to it. We've let other voices, other, uh, other influences take away the importance of that word to us. So here we are. We, Jesus is talking about the importance of the word of God. And so we have these three uh, parables about the kingdom of God and how it's supposed to work. Now, in this first one in verses 21 through 25, uh, like I said, they're more like proverbs. They're, it's not a story to illustrate a truth, uh, but, but it's, it's 
pithy little sayings that the people were kind of familiar with at the time, and Jesus is applying it to them. Uh, let's let's look, read the uh, verses 21 through 25 again. And he said to them, Is a lamp brought in to be put under a basket or under a bed and not on a stand? For nothing is hidden except to be made manifest, to be shown. Nor is anything secret except to come to light. If anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. But he said to them, pay attention to what you hear. With the measure you use it, it will be measured to you, and still more will be added to you. For to the one who has, more will be given, and from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. So what we see is the work of the kingdom, when the kingdom principles are working in our lives, in, in a church, in a society, the work is quite evident. It's apparent. Yesterday morning, we were in the hotel in Marriott in Oakland, the curtains are drawn, and those curtains really put the light out. I mean, it's dark in there. I woke up about 5 o'clock, and I'm ready for my coffee. Where's the coffee pot? Okay, it's on the cabinet there. Oh, how does this work? And I can't see a thing. I can't. I really can't. I see this black coffee pot on a black table, and uh, Diana's sleeping in the bed there, so I'm trying to be quiet. And I'm fumbling around. Where's the cup? Oh, it's got a wrapper on. I've got to take this to the bathroom and unwrap it and bring it here. Oh, wait, the whole coffee pod is in a wrapper. So I've got to take that to the bathroom, tear it open, bring it back out. Oh, wait, I've got to get some water. Go to the bathroom bring, and put the water. Where am I going to put the water? How does this go? I couldn't see anything. And then I realized I've got a phone. And this phone, it's smart. And this phone does things that I never could have done before. It has a flashlight in it. I turned that thing on, and guess what? I could see. It was, everything was apparent. It was right there. Now, I did have a problem doing things with, with <laughs> trying to hold this, but the flashlight worked. And the point was made to me how important a light is. Now, I could have had that light. Oh, I did. It was in my pocket the whole time. Well, no, actually, it wasn't in my pocket. It was on the, on the dresser. But it was hidden. Now, if I take that flashlight when I really need it and I put it back in my pocket, it's no good, is it? And that's what we're running in here. We have been given a light. Look at verse 21. Is a lamp brought in to be put in a basket or under a bed? No, that's ridiculous. And in that day, light was extremely valuable, much uh, more important than it is today. Why? We flip on a switch. They had to have a lamp full of oil. It had a little wick in it. They had to have some form of getting a, um, a, a, a spark to, to light the lamp, and you didn't want to put it out. And so you had, think of this. You guys have lived you know, or gone camping or whatever where there's nobody else around, it gets dark at night. Not like in town, you know, where you have all these lights around you. And this light is extremely important. And so you don't put it under a bed or in a, in a drawer or stick it in your pocket when you need it. The light is there. And it's quite evident around. It, you don't, uh, you put it on a stand, for nothing is hidden except to be manifest. It's supposed to be shown. And God has a plan to expose everything as it, with his light. Study light in scripture. Man, it just get, we get blown away by how, how it just goes all through the Old Testament and into the New Testament, even to the book of Revelation, when there will be no need for a lamp. Because God himself will be in the presence of his people, and he will be their light. He will be our light. How beautiful that is. It's quite evident. And this analogy of the lamp is showing us that the light needs to be exposed. 
in John chapter 3, verse 21, where Jesus is, is meeting with Nicodemus at night when it's dark. Ask, Nicodemus is asking questions. Jesus is teaching him. And in verse 21, Jesus says this, But whoever does what is true comes to the light, so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. What is light in Scripture? Now, we understand it as lights uh, producing something that, well, they're electromagnetic waves going at right angles to each other that can move through a medium uh, or the vacuum of space. Pretty incredible stuff. It doesn't really need a medium to go through. It, 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 it can go through a vacuum. I'm not talking about a Hoover, okay? <laughs> but the light is extremely apparent and it's associated with things like purity in Scripture. It's associated with truth. It's associated with accuracy and, and reality. And when God's light is in us, these things come out. Why? Because it's his nature working through us. Now, we could say not only is it quite evident, but the, the nature of light, it, the, the working of the kingdom of God and light, it's beneficial. It's beneficial for us. It's beneficial for others. It's beneficial for us. Uh, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 8. Would you turn with me there? I, I think we just need to go there and look at this. Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 8. <clears throat> now, Paul is writing this to the church at Ephesus. And he's talking about, well, let's just put it in verse um, 7 so we get the, the greater context. But he's talking about, don't be part of the darkness. Therefore, do not become partners with them, he says in verse 7. For at one time you were, what? Darkness. But now you are light in the Lord. Isn't that interesting? He's not saying darkness was in you. Or you were located. You were darkness. Boy, we don't necessarily like that terminology. That we were darkness? That, that strikes to our pride. Yeah, it probably would because pride is part of the darkness. Okay, and then it, he says, now you are light. You just don't contain light. You aren't just in the light, but you are light. And why is that? You are light in the Lord because of who? who you are, and where you are positioned in him. You are light. You are, a, well, what does it say here, the next statement? Walk as children of light. It is part of our spiritual DNA, if you want to put it that way, that we are light. And we are to shine just as God shines as Jesus shines the light of purity and truth we shine that naturally for the fruit of the light okay we're getting into fruit again the po uh, parable of the soils the fruit of light the way it shows up is found in all that is check these three things good and right and true so if the light is in us and shining in us and through us, how are we going to act? We're going to act in a good way. We're going to act in a right way and a true way. And I love this, and try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. Now, you notice verse 9 is in parentheses. That means it's kind of a, a side thought. And the translators write it that way. They did that with the New American Standard Bible, too. But check it out. If you, if you take out verse 9 and just get that thought there, walk as children of the light, verse 10, 
and try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. I love this statement. Walk behavior-wise, order your life in such a way that you are light. And the New American says, trying to learn what is pleasing to the Lord. Trying to learn. Children have to learn, right? They have to learn how to behave in certain ways, and that's just like us, and that gives me a lot of hope. I don't have to be perfect. You don't have to be perfect. We're trying to learn what is pleasing to the Lord. We keep our eyes on him. We let the light shine through us, and we're going we're gonna to mess up. We're going to fall short. Guarantee it. Can I get an amen out of that one? <laughs> I mean, we are. There's no, but we're children trying to learn what is pleasing to the Lord. Thank you, Jesus, for putting that in there for hope for us. So back into, into uh, Mark. It's beneficial. The work of, of the kingdom in us is beneficial to others. The light coming out of us. Uh, in in uh, reflecting this parable in the book of Luke, chapter 8, it, it says, uh, but puts it on a stand. They put the, the light on a stand so that those who enter may see the light. So that those who come into the house, into your, into your presence, would see the light. And that's the purpose of a light. You put it on a stand so everybody can uh, reap the benefits of it. You do. You don't stub your toe. And the others don't trip over the, the threshold coming in. That's a good thing. In Matthew chapter 5 through 7, I, I would call that the, the manifesto of the kingdom. This is the, the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus is just explaining what it's like to be living in the kingdom. He says this, in the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. That they would see the way you're different, the way you behave the way you're walking in truth, the way you're walking in purity, the way that you're not getting involved in all the darkness of the world. And people see that. And that works. The, the works that they see is much more impactful than what we say. They see your good works. And they go, what is that? That, that, that person, that, she's different. Now, I've been called different a lot of times, but that's not what I mean. These are people who are doing God's work and just loving on each other, being kind to one another. Let your light so shine before men. Well, so it, it's beneficial. It's evident but it also puts a responsibility on us. Look at verses uh, 24, halfway through in verse 25. You see this. Well, pay attention to what you hear. With the measure you use, it will be measured to you. And still more will be added to you. You know, that's kind of an interesting thought, having a measurement, you know, like a little measuring cup. And the measure you use... I, I've always thought of it as, as okay, I'm going to scoop out this much coffee and put it in. That's the measure I'm using. You know what? I, I'm starting to turn the thinking around a little bit. The measure that's been given to me of the truth of God, the word of God, the measure I use, the measure I use of that and start plugging it into my life, that's going to be the uh, the. The, the measure given to me, and then more is going to be added. How much of God's blessing, how much of his word do we actually use and plug in? How much, how often do we sit there and say, God, I need more of you. 
I need more faith. I need, I, I need more strength. I need, I need understanding uh, to get through this crisis, to deal with this financial issue. I need more strength and, and, and wisdom. <clears throat> with a family, I need more strength and wisdom. The question is, how much are we using what God has already given to us? When I thought of that this morning, I, I was blown away because I started thinking, I don't use nearly what he's offered. Why do I react the way I do? There was this guy, oh, I'm praising the Lord on the way to church this morning, and you guys do the same thing, I know. You're praising the Lord, and okay, having a great time, you know, all by myself in the car, and this guy comes screaming up on my rear end, whoa, see him in the, and immediately, my attitude turns just a little bit, <laughs> just a little bit, and, 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 you know, and why is it, why is it when we're driving, Everybody who goes slower than us is a fool. <laughs> and everybody who goes faster than us is an idiot. Yeah, well, this guy, this guy, man, I, you know, immediately it starts welling up. How quickly? Lord, why don't I have that ability to just pause and, and okay, give grace? Maybe this guy's, you know, he, he's pregnant or something, and he has to go to the hospital. <laughs> he's going to have a baby. 2024, right? Um, and, and I don't know his story. And Lord, I wish I could just pray for the guy. <laughs> and I got off the road real quick. Let him go. And why can't we handle things in a gracious way? Well, it's probably because we're filling our hearts, our minds with the stuff. And I was talking to Peggy this morning. Uh, it's stuff on TV. You know, and the news, and you listen to that, and you get all angst and, and, and ruffled. Lord, let us hear your word and let it saturate us so that we would produce the light that we're intended to show. It would just come out of us because we prepared ourselves for these things, and they will happen. So God puts the responsibility on us through this. Look at verse 24. And the measure that you, you use, it will be measured to you. But here's the hope. And still more will be added to you. You can't run out of God's good grace. There is way too much of it. And isn't that a blessing? But then we see here to the one who has, oh, no, and to and from, this is the end of verse 25, and from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. And so there is a word of caution for us. Now, I would like to err on the side of using up the measure and putting it in and, and getting more and getting more. Lord, I need you. Lord, I need you. Almost sounds like a song, doesn't it? The second major point here as we get into uh, verses 26 and 20 through 29 is the kingdom of God works autonomously. Autonomously. That means having the freedom to act independently. Kind of an interesting parable. This, uh, this, this uh, parable is unique to Mark. It's not in the other uh, gospels at all. And what we need to do is observe what happens to and in the seed. This is, this is the seed working. We have, we have a sower, and we, we have some of the things that happen as a plant starts to grow, and there's a harvest at the end, but it's really about the seed itself. There's incredible power in the seed. It, scientists still don't even really know how a seed has life in itself. Oh, we can, we can observe what happens, when we, I was a fourth grade teacher, we would take that little bean and we would put it in the soil or we would, we would do hydroponics and, 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 and put the seed in a wet um, paper towel and put it under light and watch it sprout. And you could see the little things happening to it, the roots going down, the shoot going up. It was cool. But nobody 
could understand or explain life and how that happens. Well, it's just latent in that seed. There's going to be life in it. And that's the beautiful thing that we see here. Interesting, the power of the seed. There's um, a story that's been told about um, an archaeologist who was uh, going through a pharaoh's tomb in a pyramid in Egypt. And in the burial chamber of that, uh, that king, that pharaoh, they found all kinds of things. Uh, amongst them were jars of seeds. These seeds were 3,000 years old. You would think, oh my, yeah, okay, well, we'll look at them. Well, archaeologists took one of the seeds out and planted it and watered it and it sprouted. 3,000 years old. That's the power of life in the seed. Isn't that a trip? Now, you start looking at this particular um, uh, parable and plug that little bit of knowledge in there. Verse, verse uh, 26. And then he said, the kingdom of God is as if a man should scatter seed on the ground. In another version, I think it's the New Living Translation, it actually puts the word farmer in there, substituting for man. If a farmer should scatter the seed on the ground, and we talked about that last week with the, the parable of the, the soil and the seed. Uh, uh, and he scatters the seed, verse 27, then he sleeps and rises night and day. He does what a farmer does. He plants... And then he gets up there and does his watering and gets up and goes to sleep. And the seeds sprout and it grows. Notice that phrase, he knows not how. He can't control the life. He can control the planting process. He can control the watering. He can pull the weeds. He can keep the ground nice and, you know, well watered and, and tended. In verse 28, the earth produces by itself. First the blade, then the ear, then the full grain in the ear. So there's the whole process of the growth of that plant. But when the grain is ripe, at once he puts in the sickle because the harvest has come. So what does the farmer do? Cast the seed on the ground, waters it, pulls weeds, and then waiting for it to come to bear the fruit and then puts in the sickle and harvests it. So what we see here is that the word of God works mysteriously. He knows not how, it says. The earth produces by itself. Man can only do so much as we're sowing the word, the gospel, as we're giving it out. We broadcast it. We give it to whoever. We just live it out and let the light shine. Sometimes we have to, we, we get to share the gospel directly. Sometimes we live it out and people just pick up the beauty of, of what God is doing in you. <clears throat> but there's other forces at work. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 6, Paul writing to the church at, uh, in Corinth writes this interesting uh, line, basically, I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. And that explains it. You know, uh, different people have different impact on the, the growing of the plant, but we really don't grow it. We tend it. We tend it. And just like you coming in here, I'm not causing the spiritual growth in you. There's no way I could do that. My job is to take this and teach you with it and let the word of God go deep in your hearts and your lives and let the spirit of God bring that life and that, that, that fruit out in your life. That's the, the, the way the kingdom works. <clears throat> The word of God works mysteriously, but it's interesting. 
He doesn't need us to do this work. He doesn't need us. The work is his. God causes the increase. But the unique thing, the really special thing, is God chooses to work with us. He chooses to. He partners with his people to bring about results. We get to join in in the work and enjoy the harvest. Why are you here? Because God did a work in you, and you start stepping out in faith, and, God, and, and you see the growth of what God's doing, and the light is shining, and then you gather together as a people, because why? He tells us to, and we, we understand that this is what we're supposed to be doing, <clears throat> and then we reap the benefit of being together, to encourage one another, to sing our praise together with, uh, with each other as brothers and sisters in the Lord, to glorify him, and he's bringing that growth. That's the beauty of this. In verse 26, a man should scatter seed on the ground. That's the, that's the part that we get to do, and then the sickle gets put in. Do you notice here, you don't see any books about evangelism. You don't see any programs of, oh, you got to do these five steps and everyone's going to come to the Lord through that. You don't see that. It's the work of God in people's heart. It's get them the word. Get them the word. All of us, let's make a commitment to getting in, reading the word, hearing from God, and letting him cause the increase. Why? Because then he starts impacting our life, changing our life, and then your family sees it, your kids see this, and your grandkids see that something's different. My, you know, my, everybody else's parents are all messed up, and, and, and you guys seem to kind of have together. What is it? It's Jesus. It's the true seed. Now, I'm going to say this, too. Be patient. We want that harvest right now, don't we? You know, I want to be everything that God wants me to have right now. But that's not God's way. <laughs> it's a slow process. You see it even here. You see that it's a slow process, that, that the farmer is sleeping and rises night and day, and the seed sprouts and grows, and then there's the blade and the ear and the full grain, and then, so you have to wait. Be patient. First of all, I would say this, be patient with yourself. God is not done with you. Isn't that a good thing? Yeah, he's working in you. He, and, and, but what we have to do is we, and especially as we mature in the Lord, we're responsible for feeding ourselves in the word of God. If the only time you get in the scripture is on Sunday morning, you're starving, my friend. This is something that you need to be doing each and every day, multiple times a day, processing the word of God through your mind and your heart so that you grow in faith, so that you understand the will of God. Yeah. But it's for you. It's also for those around you. You're praying for your family members. Keep praying. God wants to build that rooted plant in your life of faith, faith for others, faith for things to happen in your life. Oh, how many of you want to get out of Oregon? Oh, I don't like this, this state. It's too, too liberal, too going crazy and all this kind of stuff. It's, you know what? God's planted you right here. I'm sorry. And let's just say we have a lot of good fertilizer here. Uh, so <laughs> we'll grow. <laughs> oh, I'm going to get some emails out of that. Uh, <clears throat> we have a lot of good nutrients in this soil in which uh, to grow. A lot of good opportunity. And if we try to go where everybody else is going, guess what? Everybody else is going there too. And it's just going to get as bad as it is here. It, but be a light where God is has planted you. 
Now, there's seasons where God, you know, I know some of you have been looking for places to retire and all that. Yeah, you, God bless you. That's, that, you know, that happens. Uh, it, but I'm just saying, it, it's very easy for us to look to the horizon and, oh, I want to go there when we're missing the opportunities to be the light right here. Don't miss that opportunity. Okay, enough of that. Third point, kingdom of God. We see in this parable of the mustard seed, the kingdom of God grows from minuscule to massive. Verse 30. And he said, with what can we compare the kingdom of God or what parable shall we use for it? You know, in my weird way of thinking, I was looking at this statement saying, was he just making this up on the spot? You know, well, 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 wait, can we compare the kingdom of God? Well, you know, he's just thinking about it. No. No, he had this in his mind. He needed to share this. This was good stuff. It is like a grain of mustard seed, which when it's sown on the ground is the smallest of all kinds, all of the seeds on, on the earth. Yet when it is sown, it grows up and becomes larger than all the garden plants and puts out large branches so that the birds of the air can make nests in the shade. So now that we understand that, we can close our Bibles. And this is a weird one. I mean, this is really an interesting thing. Okay, so we can break it down. The kingdom of God... What he's establishing right there in Israel, what's going to continue on, is illustrated in this. You have the mustard seed. Now, mustard seed uh, is, is very small. He's using a hyperbole. He's not using scientific terms here. That it is the smallest seed, scientifically, we found this out because actually there's other smaller seeds. He's using hyperbole. And that was a common tool to uh, illustrate something or to get people's attention on how things work. Just like we say it now. I'm so hungry, I could eat a horse. Go for it. Let's see that. Uh, or he's as big as a house. <laughs> no. Um, so hyperbole is something that's commonly used. It was back then. So he's saying the mustard seed is the smallest kind of seed there is. And you s spread it out. And then it grows. Uh, verse 32, when it's sown, it grows up and becomes larger than all the garden plants and puts out long branches. Okay, so... In our understanding of mustard today, the plants typically grow about three feet. That's just the way they are. These are kind of hybrids. Uh, there were some plants that they called mustard uh, plants in Israel at that time, or, or in the Middle East there, that would actually grow up six feet, ten feet tall, and have a woody stem. Okay? So, you know, that you can see how this is playing out. So, maybe that's what he's talking about. What he's what he gets to is, it, is, is that it's something very small and it grows really large. Okay, so that's a, a basic understanding. It grows larger. So, so what we could say here is the realm, the kingdom realm, has greatly or expanded greatly. It, it, it just grows. It's huge. And... That's exactly what happened. I mean, here they are in a little backwater area of Galilee in northern Israel. Jesus pulled out a couple of disciples, said, follow me, and then it just keeps growing, growing. Then these huge crowds are following him. And then we started thinking historically, after Jesus' time, then it, it, is, it has permeated, Christianity has permeated the Roman Empire, and then from the Roman Empire, it continues on through Europe and then continues on through the Middle Ages. Now, then it goes in and comes over to North America and, and South America with Catholicism down there. I mean, it just really becomes prolific. Okay, we can understand that. Maybe that's what it is. Then... You have to keep reading it, it says there in verse 32, so that became so big, they put out large branches, so that the birds of the air can make nests in its shade. Now, this is kind of an interesting thing, because the birds, um, 
in a small plant, a mustard plant, even if it was 10 feet tall, there's, you can't fit a lot of birds in there, right? What do the birds mean? Um, there's different views on that. And I'm going to tell you the right one. <laughs> but I'm not sure which one it is. <laughs> I'm going to give you two interpretations. The birds, if you were to go right on up to... Um, uh, verse, let's see, 15. And look there. This is the parable of the soils. And in verse 4, Jesus gives the parable. In verse 15, he explains the parable. So in verse 4, and he, as he sowed, some of the feet, seed fell along the path, and the birds came and devoured it. Now, are birds really good right there? Yeah, they come and eat up all this good seed. The seed is the word of God. You go to verse 15, and where Jesus explains this to his disciples, and these are the ones along the path where the word is sown. When they hear, Satan immediately comes and takes away the word that was sown in them. So what are birds being equated to? Satan. The work of Satan coming to snatch away the word. So if we were to apply this, this uh, parable uh, using that bit of knowledge, what would that mean? That evil influences are going to come into the branches of Christianity and create an evil influence. Has that ever happened? Oh, absolutely. I mean, the, we could go on and, and talk about different cults and, and things like that and, 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 and uh, groups that have taken and twisted the truth of the gospel horrendously, uh, creating death and devastation in people's lives. Yeah, that's happened. That would be a, a, an appropriate uh, interpretation of it. So, evil influences. The other way of looking at this could be this. That the teaching of Jesus, the kingdom of Jesus, becomes so all-encompassing that the, the tree grows and birds come in and there is a kind of a cryptic reference in Ezekiel chapter 17, verse 23, where Ezekiel is given a vision of the end times, or the times, I should say, and, and we read this verse. On the mountain height of Israel, I will plant it. Now, in the previous verses, it's taken, uh, talking about a, uh, a sprig, a, a part of a plant that's taken off, and he says, on the mountain height, I will plant it, that it may bear branches and produce fruit and become a noble cedar. And under it, in this noble cedar that is going to happen as time goes on. Now, Ezekiel, remember, is hundreds of years before Jesus. And under it, under this noble cedar, will dwell every kind of bird in the shade of its branches birds of every sort will nest. Interesting if this is taken in that way where the kingdom of God has grown. The reign and the rule of Jesus Christ. That's the kingdom of God, the reign and the rule of Jesus Christ. And it has grown. And then the birds, and here the birds are meeting Gentiles. They're meaning people from all over the world have come and they come to dwell in the beauty of the tree of the noble cedar of God. Hmm. Well, that's true too. Many of us, I'd say probably most of us in this room are not of, of the Jewish heritage. We're Gentiles who have come to the Lord and we receive his blessing. 
And that's how the kingdom works. We have received his blessing. And as his people, we just give thanks. We see that through these, these parables, we're entrusted with his word and we're to live it out. We see that his word implanted in our lives is something that's a mystery. We're not sure quite how it works, but it needs to be watered. It needs to be tended. We need to let his word grow in our lives. And then as the kingdom has grown, we have enjoyed the uh, benefits of being part of his kingdom. What a blessing that is. So what do we do when we go out from here? Praise God. Let his light shine through us. And if you have to, talk. Our lives are the greatest of, of um, illuminators of who Jesus is. But feel free to share, because it's not meant to stick in your pocket. It's meant to be out there shining. And I don't mean it. I mean the Lord Jesus Christ. So may that be what we do this week. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you that you have given to us uh, this word, this bit of encouragement. Three uh, different parables by which we need to pay attention, to hear, to absorb, to apply. So help us in this. Lord, we want to follow you in all of our ways. We want your light to shine through us. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.